Well, hello and welcome back to Principles of Accounting 1. I'm your host, Dr. B. Uh, y- you made it to the third week, so that's a good sign, yeah? Um, this week, we're going to be talking about merchandise. We're going to be talking about inventory. We're going to be talking about how do we account for our inventory. Uh, how do we value inventory? Those are the things we're going to be talking about this week. Before we jump into our conversations on inventory, uh, inventory-related things, I want to quickly call your attention to the classroom. Very important stuff going on here. Now, at the beginning of this course, I had said very clearly, hopefully I said this very clearly, that the only way you can pass this class is by doing the work. Yeah, that was, I was clear on that, I think. Very clear on this. You pass the course by doing the work. Now, what does doing the work mean? As you know, there is at least one assignment per chapter. Per chapter, yeah. So if we go back to Module 1. Module 1, we had the first two weeks. Week 1, you had a quiz and a homework assignment. Chapter 1 quiz, Chapter 2 homework assignment. That was week 1, which most of you have done all that. Week 2, we had two items, a Chapter 3 quiz and a Chapter 4 discussion. Now, I know, okay, I, I get it. You know, we get a little behind sometimes. Uh, life gets in the way. You get the vid. You get whatever else going on in life. I get it, Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying this because I really don't want you to fall behind. Okay, please don't fall behind. You have one thing due uh, for each chapter in each week. That's two things per week. Last week, yesterday, you should have completed the Chapter 3 quiz, Chapter 4 discussion. Okay, that will do yesterday. Uh, I updated the grade book already. If you're late, you know you're late, uh, get it done. Yeah? Here's why. Don't fall behind. If you fall behind and there's two chapters every week, you're going to have a serious trouble when it comes to the... the other. So if you're... If, I want to talk to If you're behind and you haven't uh, completed the quiz or the discussion, get it done. Get it done as soon as you possibly can, okay? Uh, please. It's worth 5% of your grade for the quiz. It's worth 5% of your grade for the discussion, okay? Do not skip anything in this course. If you skip something, you're just saying, oh, I don't care about half a letter grade. That's what you're telling me, yeah? And so uh, don't miss anything, please. It, this is just to help you. I don't want you to fall behind. So for whatever reason, you didn't complete the Chapter 3 quiz, Chapter 4 discussion, get it done as soon as you possibly can. Because falling behind in this class will definitely hurt you, especially when we get closer to that midterm, which, by the way, is next week. Okay, so please, 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 please get caught up. Uh, okay, sorry about that. I... Uh, you know, it hurts me when people fall behind. It does. because, I, And I, I get it. You know, sometimes we get sick. Sometimes the life happens to us. I get that. I do. I, I promise you I understand. Prof- uh, Professor? Yes, ma'am. Ms. I Edwards. do have a question. That, that, you, that, you, that you, oh, that I do have a question. Please. I, okay. It's your, it's your, you, you, you're reading and doing the work. Is there a, a certain way that you can you, in other words, if it's open, if it's open, can you go ahead and do it, do the assignment? Absolutely. Yes. Open book, okay. open, open whatever. Yes. And I wanted to mention one other thing that I, I seriously just noticed, just noticed earlier today when I was looking through everything, the the, orient, the orientation yes, early on, mm-hmm. I actually... Did not even know it was there. That's the only reason why it wasn't done. Oh, I something okay. the orientation from, from the very beginning. I actually didn't even didn't even right. know it was there. 
That's fine. Uh, yeah, the, the orientation is not required, but it, but if you know okay, if you're not familiar because, with Blackboard, that's the time to do it. Uh, yeah, that's the that's the only reason why I didn't do do that though. I did not. Did, okay. Yeah. Well, I thank you. So you're okay, welcome. then because. All right then. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, excellent questions. Yes. Uh, at any time you're taking a quiz, a homework assignment, discussion board, or whatever. Open book, open note. It, it's the same for the final exam. It's midterm and final. Open book, open note. You know, there's it. It's there. <laughs> okay, so so please, open book, open note. You know, there's no reason for you not to get in there. Yes, uh, yes, please, Celsi. Sorry, um, for the the exams. Thank yeah. you for making it open book and open note. Do you also provide study guides, or at least no. just what we should? No, no, no okay. study guides. Uh, the, uh, the, I'm glad you asked that question, but no, I don't provide any study guides. Uh, my recommendation, and I usually do this recommendation when it comes time for the midterm exam and the final exam is that you review, uh, the recordings, of the PowerPoint presentations, review your homework assignments. The questions are very similar to your homework assignments uh, that you get on the quizzes and the, the homework. Yeah. Uh, that's my recommendation for success. Uh, the PowerPoints, the homework quizzes, um, the lectures, you review those things, you'll be fine. Uh, you got your textbook there. You know, you, there's no reason for you not to ace the midterm or the final in this course. Um, the only reason why you might not is, you know, you accidentally answered it wrong. <laughs> you know, that's uh, a but, you know, uh, the, the point that I'm getting at is it's op everything's open book, open note. So, I mean, it's there. Uh, there's only one attempt on the midterm and final. The midterm exam covers chapters one through, uh, the midterm exam covers chapters one through eight, and the final exam covers chapters nine through 14. So, yeah, uh, there's, on the midterm, I think it's like 10 questions. Uh, no, but the final exam is 20 questions. My she had work, my son, I was picking up my granddaughter. I'm sorry, Shanae, did you have a question? You good? No, Professor, I'm sorry. Okay. I was talking. That, hey, no worries. That's all right. Just making sure. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm wondering if we can go through the quizzes and the exams, and because like some of them are wrong, and to be honest, I struggle with some questions. So I don't. I'm not sure if we can go through them and correct them. So, so in the in the exam, we can get it right. So we can't do that during class time, but we can do that during office hours. Um, okay, perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Professor, I'm sorry. I do have a quick question. Yes, Mara. Yes. So for um, the assignments are and the quizzes, are both attempts due on the like listed uh, no. due date? Or is just one the, attempt due? Just as long as that first attempt is done by the due date, you're good. You could go okay. back later on and, you know, try that second attempt. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Thanks for asking. It. Okay, cool. Uh, so I'll get off my soapbox. I apologize. I just, <laughs> you know, my responsibility as a professor is to make sure that you don't fall behind as a student. And, you know, my objective is to help you to understand the content, understand the information, and of course, to help you pass the course, right? I wouldn't be doing my job if that wasn't the case. So um, without further ado, Let's talk about inventory, Professor. Yes, please. Okay. Zach, I, I haven't, I haven't completed the um, responses to the discussion board. Get it Can in. I go back and do them? I, I've yes. uh, just got a little behind all that. That's all right, Zach. If you could get those responses, the two responses to your classmates in, uh, in the next, like today or tomorrow or the day after. Yes, please do. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. Great question. Okay. Let's talk about inventory. <laughs> Merchandising. You hear the word merchandise, think inventory. Inventory. Or the word merchandise, it means inventory. It's the same thing. Merchandise means inventory. Okay. In accounting. In accounting, we uh, talk about service businesses, merchandise businesses, and manufacturing businesses. That's pretty much everyone. Yeah. Service business is a business that provides a service 
to someone else. An example would be a barber shop, a hair salon, a nail stylist, a lawn care service, a driveway plowing service. Uh, these are services. You know what services are. Then we have retailers. Retailers are businesses that provide, they sell goods. They sell, they sell inventory. They sell goods. They sell what this thing called merchandise. That's inventory. They sell you their inventory. Uh, and then you have manufacturers. Manufacturers are the companies that make the goods <laughs> to be sold. Yeah. Uh, and so in accounting, we look at the three different types of businesses differently. Uh, a service business, I'm looking at their revenue and their expenses. A merchandising or a retailer, I'm looking at their revenue, their costs of goods sold, and their expenses. For a manufacturer, I'm looking at their revenue, their different types of inventory, their cost of goods manufactured, and their expenses. So in accounting, I look at service businesses, retailers, also known as merchandisers, and manufacturers differently, slightly. And the difference is going to be on the income statement and the balance sheet. And I'll, I'll explain those differences to you. And of course, I use some ratios to analyze their information. Uh, and yeah, so let me show you what it all looks like. Again, we're, we're looking at this from the perspective of a retailer. A retailer is a merchandiser. The word merchandise means inventory. And uh, there's a couple differences between the different types of businesses. <clears throat> a service business is concerned with providing you with a service. A barber shop, a hair salon, a nail stylist, uh, a lawyer, an accountant, a dentist, uh, a plumber, uh, an electrician, uh, there's a lot of them, right? They provide a service uh, to you. They sell you a service. Their revenue is service revenue. That's what they earn from providing you a service. And their, on their income statement, it's real simple, their income statement. They have revenue minus expenses equals net income so their service revenue minus all of their expenses like you know all of the expenses rent wages utilities office supplies in uh you know whatever there's a bunch of different um expenses revenue minus all of their expenses equals net income that's the, a service business. Very, very simple income statement. A retailer, let's say Macy's or Nordstrom or, you know, one of, one of your favorite retailers. I don't know. Is Nordstrom still in business? I don't even think they are. Okay. So Macy's, one of the remaining few, uh, their income statement looks a little different than a service one does. A service company, as I had said earlier, has revenue minus their expenses equals net income. Very simple, very short, easy. A retailer, ha they have a few additional line items on their income statement. It follows the same process so we have sales, also known as retail sales, uh, also known as merchandise sales. They're sales. So see how it's a sales, not revenue. 
But it's the same thing. With sales is revenue. It's the same thing. But it's just called it's called sales because they're selling you product, you inventory. They're selling you some products to earn their revenue. So sales minus cost of goods sold. Let's break that down. Cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold means the cost of what it took that retailer, that business, to acquire and sell that product to you. Okay, I'm going to give you an example. Here's a bottle of water in my hand. This bottle of water came from Costco. Okay. Well, let's say, let's say, uh, Let's say I have a water business. Oh, no. Let's say I'm Costco. Okay. I'm going to sell you this bottle of water. I'm going to sell you this one bottle of water for a dollar. Okay. That's, these days, that's a good price. I'm going to sell you this for a dollar. That's the sale price. Is one dollar for this bottle of water. It cost the business, Costco, something to acquire that bottle of water. Okay, so if I'm Costco and I'm the sale price of this bottle of water is $1, it probably cost Costco 10 cents for that bottle of water that they got from their distributor. Okay, so here's, here's how the real world works. Let's say I'm Costco and I sell this bottle of water for a dollar. I had to get this bottle of water to my store to sell to you. Here's where it starts. Way back over there, okay? Uh, this manufacturer gets the raw materials, water and plastic. They make a, a, a empty shell. They fill it with water. They put a cap on it. They put it with a bunch of other bottles of water. And then they sell it to their distributor, who then sells it to Costco. That's how real life works. It came from somewhere. The bottles just didn't magically show up on Costco's shelves. Costco bought it from their distributor, who bought it from the manufacturer. That's called the distribution channel. Okay? That's how distribution works. That's how things show up on store shelves. They don't, it's not magic. There's not a magic place. There's, Santa's workshop doesn't live in the back of Costco. Okay? The, the inventory comes from somewhere. The inventory orig, originated when it was made at the manufacturer. Okay? Manufacturer filled the bottle with bottle of water with water. They made the plastic mold. They put a cap on it. Went down the conveyor belt. Went into a big box with a lot of other boxes, and they put they sold those boxes to a distributor. The distributor then went to Costco. Said, "Hey, I got a bunch of boxes to sell you." Costco said, "Great." Then they bought a bunch of water. That's how it works. That's how everything works when it comes to retailers. The retailer is not making the products themselves. They're buying it from someone else. Right? Macy's doesn't have a facility where they're making clothing. They're buying the clothes from the distributor who bought it from a manufacturer. Macy's ain't making the shirts themselves. They might have a tag on it that says Macy's, but Macy's didn't make it. Nope, it's like, normally out of state or out of country. Mike, tell me, what's that? Well, no, no, I just said, you know, it's normally from maybe like um, Eastern Asia and everything like that, sure. or um, India, and they send it over, they make for a cheaper price, you know, trade and everything. You which got it. There was a period of time, sorry for going off tangent, but there was a period of time where things were, you know, clothing were made in the States. I think maybe there's yep. still like, smaller ones, but... Yep. It is what it is. You know, Percent. money at the end of the day. 
the 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 global the global economy is very small now. With the borders are very small; they almost don't exist. So so here's how it works. In real life, at, at a place like Macy's or Nordstrom or whatever, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some inside information. Okay, I know a lot about this because I used to uh, be a manager at a Sears store. For those of you who remember what Sears was. Uh, so here's how it works. Uh, when you're a, when you go into the store, let's say you go to Macy's and you're looking for a, a new shirt, okay? And the shirt costs uh, the 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 tag says it's it's nineteen dollars ninety nine cents. Yeah. Okay, great. So twenty bucks for a shirt, reasonable. It's you know it's what the market says. Okay, great. So how did it, that get to be? How did that red shirt get on the on the shelf at Macy's? Well, here's how the process it went through. That shirt started off as some fabric, okay, or some threads, over in Bangladesh. They're really good with textiles in Bangladesh, by the way. They're experts at it. That's why a lot of retailers get their stuff from Bangladesh. So from Bangladesh, they're making the sh the, the red shirts from Macy's. When they're done, but they don't know who who Macy's is. They're not. They don't have a relationship with Macy's. There's a distributor that has a relationship with the with the manufacturer in Bangladesh. So here's how it works. They get the red cloth. They get the the materials they need to manufacture it, and there's some labor cost, right? Hourly wages. So each red shirt probably costs the manufacturer about five cents to make. I'm not exaggerating, by the way. That's a real cost. So five cents to make the shirt, okay? The shirt and a bunch of other ones get sold to the distributor. Uh, the distributor paid probably 10 cents, okay? So double the cost. So the distributor paid 10 cents to the manufacturer. The manufacturer, it cost them 5 cents to make. So, uh, so they got, the, so the distributor purchased the each shirt for 10 cents, cost the manufacturer 5 cents to make. The distributor comes to Macy's. Macy's purchases each red shirt for uh, about a dollar, we'll say. Okay. You know they're covering the cost of shipping it. They're covering a lot of a lot of expense there, right? So the distributor charges them a dollar. The distributor walks off with probably fifty cents in profit. Now, you got Macy's. They bought this shirt for a dollar. So Macy's cost of goods sold is one dollar for that shirt that they're selling for nineteen dollars and ninety nine cents. So net sales, 20 bucks. Cost of goods sold, $1. That means that Macy's makes $19 of profit from each red shirt that they sell. Make sense? That is the distribution channel. That's how it works in real life. Okay? That's why when you go to Macy's and you go to the clearance rack... And you're like, oh my goodness, it's 80% off. How can they afford to sell it to me for that cheap? So it originally cost 20 bucks. They marked it down to, oh, we'll say they marked it down to um, $7, okay? 20 bucks, now it's $7. Oh, how do, uh, they must be losing money. No, they're not. <laughs> they're not even close. In fact... They're still making a $6 profit. Okay. So, on clothing specifically, it's close to a 1,000% markup. And I'm not exaggerating. That's Those are real numbers. On furniture, it's an 800% markup. Okay. Not exaggerating. Those are real numbers. On jewelry, it's a 400% markup. Not exaggerating. Those are real numbers. Okay. Believe me when I tell you that these retailers, they know what they're doing. They are making a lot of money 
off of things like clothing, jewelry, furniture, whatever, right? Those are big margin types of products. Very normal. Very, very normal. That's, that's normal practice for these, these types of retailers. So that's how it works in real life. But let me go back to my water example. I'm Costco. I sell you a, a bottle of water for a dollar. It cost me 10 cents, okay, for that bottle of water. So that means my gross profit is 90 cents. A dollar minus 10 cents, cost of goods sold, equals 90 cents is my gross profit. And then, of course, I have some expenses. Um, so my net income is probably 50 cents. But that's, that's how merchandising works. So we have net sales, which is the sales from products, minus cost of goods sold. The cost of goods sold is the cost it took for that company to acquire that product. So again, my example, a dollar for the water. That's how much I'm selling it for. It cost me 10 cents to get this bottle of water from my distributor. So the, the cost of goods sold is the cost that took the company to get that bottle of water to sell to you. Make sense? Everyone understands cost of goods sold now? Yes. It's yeah. Like well, sir. Right. There's a little bit more that goes into it, but that's that's the basics of it. Yes, please go ahead, Esmeral. Um, so um I was just wondering when they, for example, when um things go out of style or they change season and they have to put things on clearance, yeah. do they like claim that as a loss? No, because there's no loss involved. They're still making a massive profit off of that those clearance items. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's <laughs> believe me, there's no loss on clearance. <laughs> Businesses don't lose money like that. <laughs> no clearance. Uh, they, now, now remember, as Merritt, they mark they mark it up a lot. You know, the original sale price is about a thousand times what they what they bought it for. When they put it on clearance, they're not losing any money. I guarantee that. I was just expecting them to like, I guess, double profit where like they kind of say, hey, this is what it was supposed to go for. And then we put it on clearance. And then, yeah, but yeah. you never know how much they bought it for when they put it on clearance. So, oh, you know what I mean? So like, let's let's say there's a, a stereo and uh, it costs, they're selling it for a hundred bucks. Okay. It probably cost them maybe $10 to get it in. And so what they'll do is they'll they'll put it on clearance because it didn't sell well, and they'll reduce that price to um, instead of 100, they'll put it on 50 percent off, right? Clearance. Uh, so they'll sell it for 50 bucks. It only cost them ten dollars to get it. So they still made a uh, what a thirty dollar profit. So <laughs> you know they they didn't lose any money. Good question. But no, there's no such thing as a loss when it's on clearance. The only time a company would sell something at a loss is when they sell it for less than what they bought it for. So, for example, go back to my water. Remember, I'm, I sold this for a dollar. It cost me 10 cents to, to get it to me, right? So it costs a good sold 10 cents. If I sold this for 5 cents, then that's a loss. Or anything less than 10 cents is a loss. Good question. So, so net sales minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit. The word, the why, why do they call it gross profit? Gross profit means the profit before expenses. That's why it says gross profit. Gross profit means profit before expenses. So net sales minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit. Minus expenses equals net income. And that is the income statement for a merchandise company. So the focus is going to be on these two items, cost of goods sold and gross profit. Because those are the, that's the difference between a merchandise business retailer versus a service company. So I talked about the flow of merchandise briefly. In retail, we have this thing called an operating cycle. And it's a it's a circle. It goes round and round and round. <laughs> okay. So here's how it works. I I uh, use my cash in my business 
to purchase inventory. I had to purchase the water, remember? It cost me 10 cents to purchase it. So I'm going to take 10 cents and purchase a bottle of water inventory. I take that inventory and I sell it. There's two methods of sales. There's cash from cash customers. They came in, they bought some cash. They used some cash to, to buy the bottle of water for a dollar. Then I have this thing called credit customers. Credit customer is not what you think it is. A credit customer does not mean they used a credit card. It means that they purchased it using accounts receivables. Hopefully you remember accounts receivable from the earlier chapters. But an account receivable is when a customer made the purchase from the business on credit. And they're going to pay the business later. Okay, here's how it works. Customer comes in and they go, hey, you know what? I'll buy a case of that water from you. But I'm going to pay you in 30 days from now. Okay. So the Costco will sell the case of water to that customer. And that customer will pay us in 30 days. That's called accounts receivable. I am Costco. I expect to receive cash in the future from my customer because I sold it to them on credit. So there are two types of customers. Ones that pay cash up front. And the other type of customer are the ones that purchased it on credit. They're going to pay you later through accounts receivable. And then 30 days will go by, you'll collect that cash, and then you'll do it all over again. You'll purchase some more water. It'll come in. You'll sell it to your customers, either on with cash or uh, through accounts receivable. You'll collect your accounts receivable later. Then you'll do it again and again and again. That's called the operating cycle for a retail business. They use that cash that they get from their sales to purchase more inventory. They sell more inventory. They take that cash to buy more inventory. The cycle goes on and on. But that's this operating cycle. Okay. Inventory. Inventory can be somewhat complex. Okay. Inventory can be somewhat complex. Because inventory, uh, we get it in, we sell it, we get it in, we sell it, but it's continuous. It's a continuous process. I, I need to make sure I always have my inventory available for sale. I can't have an empty shelf, okay? Empty shelf is real bad for business. <laughs> it's hard to sell something you don't have, right? So... How do we make sure we always have inventory? We continuously purchase it throughout the, throughout the month, throughout the year. So I start the month with beginning inventory. I have some inventory already on my shelf. At, at the beginning of this, of this month, January, I had inventory of water already on my shelf ready to be sold. So that's called my beginning inventory. It was already there at the beginning of the month. Then, throughout the month of January, I purchased several more cases of water coming into my Costco store. So, I started the month with some water. I purchased some more water throughout the month. All of those things together, we call that merchandise available for sale. Merchandise available for sale. It's what I have available for sale on my shelf. Okay? The merchandise available for sale comes from the ending inventory plus the cost of goods sold. Ending inventory is what we're left with at the end of the month. Call that ending inventory. Plus, Cost of goods sold, cost of goods sold, as you know, is the amount 
it took for us to purchase the inventory and then sell it. Cost of goods sold. In my inventory, I have two different methods of tracking it. Each type of retailer selects one or the other. They don't go between the two of them. All right. You select one and you stick with it. It depends on your type of business. Uh, Mike, remind me, what, what, kind of, what kind of business is it? Like what kind of products? Oh, do I sell or just in general? The, the one, what, what do you sell? Oh, well, uh, I normally I work at a Petco, so it's normally um, cat. Uh, sorry, let me go in terms of uh, business. Dog, cat, small animal items normally. That's okay, what I normally Petco. sell. Gotcha. Yeah. All right, cool. So, so Petco probably uses what we call the perpetual inventory system, okay? Because it probably has one of these gizmos on it. A barcode, a barcode, okay? So with Petco or Costco or any co, right, the retailers, most of them use the perpetual inventory system. The way that works is that with every sale, it updates what they have on hand. So let's say I'm a customer at Petco. I see Mike, he's cashing me out, okay? I, I bring the stuff that I bought to the register, or um, that I'm buying to the register. When he scans the barcode from the products that I'm buying, it's taking it out of the store's inventory. It's like well, the store no longer has it, I have it, right? I got to take it out of inventory. So when, as soon as that barcode hits the register and it reads it, takes it out of inventory so that way the store knows that hey i sold one of those right okay so it's what that's why we call it perpetual it continuously updates the inventory records for each item that i sell so it's like okay so i sold one can of dog food so i so i know that i have less less one can than when i started with perpetual the minute it hits that barcode, it updates the system. So the store always knows what they have on hand. That's why we call it a perpetual inventory system. Very commonly used among retailers that continuously sell the same products. Now, the other type of system is used for different types of retailers. Here's what I mean by this. Perpetual systems are used by places like Petco, Costco, Walmart, uh, you name it, right? The, the retailers. Because they use the barcode system. You bring up some stuff to the register, they scan it, comes out of inventory. A car dealership does not do that. There's no one at the car dealership going out to the car window and scanning a barcode. No. <laughs> that would be silly. It's kind of funny and silly at the same time. No, they don't. It, they don't sell a car and then another car comes in and replaces it. No, it doesn't work that way. Not at a car dealership. So at a car dealership, they use what we call the periodic inventory system. They manually update their accounting records, what they sold and bought at the end of each accounting period. So like, oh, I bought forty-five cars, sold ten. Bought 20 cars, sold 30, etc. Right? But they they don't sell that frequently, which is why that type of business uses the periodic system. Make sense? Yeah. Good. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yes, Professor. Yes, it does. Now I got a better idea of how I sell things. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, exactly. So, Mike, you use the period, the the perpetual system uh, at your place because so it's the. Just, I just have a question. Yes. So, uh, the periodic uh, system is like the inventory is updated for a, each purchase. 
for this pay transaction. Yeah. But now the other system is just like whenever we make purchases, or we sell. Yeah, you're on the right track. So, so it's it's kind of the same, no? They're similar, but they but it's all about when we record the transactions. So in the perpetual system, it's done at the at the time of each purchase, or at the time of each sale. You know, it's a, it's the barcode system is the perpetual system. The periodic system is a manual process, and we only update sales and purchases at the end of the accounting period. The so, ending of that accounting period, okay. Exactly, and that's why it depends on the type of business because. Uh, um, a, re a large box retailer like a Petco or a Walmart or whatever, they use Perpetual because they're continuously selling and they need to know exactly what they have on hand at all times. Professor? But I know like uh, on those uh, like Walmart, they do manually, they count the, their inventory. They do, manually. but that's, that's called once an inventory week, audit. That's called an inventory oh, that's audit, which the is audit. a lot. Okay. Yeah. What that does is it validates what they have on the shelves is is correct in the system. Gotcha, thank you. Yep, it's a little different. Cool, good question. Uh, yes. So I, oh. Professor, so this is why they can, they're able to like, um, when they have like their little um, scanners with them, they're able to tell you how many um, articles of the same um, product they have. Correct. Yeah, that's 100% correct. Yeah. Yep. That, they, yeah, that's what, yeah. Yeah, so go ahead, Professor. Sorry. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. That's that's how they're able to tell you exactly how many units they have on hand. So yeah. it's the same like 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 if I go on to Petco's website, right, and I know the exact store that I'm going to go to, I can find a product that I want to buy, and they'll tell me how many they have on the shelf. Man, suck my dick. Kind of, sort of, right? <laughs> but, I have a quick question. Yes. So you know small stores that we go to that don't um scan their stuff they kind of get it from like let's say costco and stuff or like they kind of like plug in the actual price of the item is that still perpetual or is that periodic mm, uh, give me an example what kind of store like let's say for example a convenience store um and they don't scan the barcodes they just kind of plug in the numbers they probably use the periodic system Okay. All right. Yeah. Good question. Um, yeah. Small, like small convenience stores, or um, let's say you go to a uh, a consignment shop or a, a thrift shop, uh, like um, uh, we'll say uh, Goodwill or um, yeah, you know, one of those types of stores. But they use the periodic system because they have infrequent products uh, that they that they manually enter. When it's done manually, it's probably the periodic system. Great question. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Fun discussion. All right. So those are the two different. I have a quick question. Yes. Periodic please. table. Yep. So what if you go to something? Um, it would be periodic if you went to something like a um, farmer's market. Because yep. they're just based off of however many items they bring in. And yeah. they have to manually put in their inventory. Correct? Exactly. Yeah. They, they probably don't. Uh, have a scanner at the farmer's market. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm just thinking like, cause someone, because I know they produce so much and they sell so much, like how would they be able to keep track of, you know, just it's harder for them with their profits and what they sold and Eps. inventory. Eps. Yeah. Great question, Tiffany. So, so the way that, so and I can give you a real life example, cause I used to do that. Um, so when I would sell some of my organic food products at the farmer's markets, the way I would do it is I would, I, I came into the market uh, with an exact amount of inventory, okay? It's like once it's sold, my day at the market's done, yeah? Uh, but I also know how much I have in my warehouse. So I know how much I have in my warehouse. I know how much I brought to the market. I, so that's my beginning balance inventory, okay? So my beginning balance is what I started that day with. Uh, then of course I know I'm going to sell, right? So at the end of the day, I count what I have left ending inventory plus cost of goods sold tells me how many is sold. So 
that's the that's the periodic system for that example because I'm not continuously updating as I'm selling them. I counted them at the beginning and I counted them at the end. So that's a periodic system. Good question. Yeah, it's definitely a periodic system. Thank you. You're Thank very you. welcome. Good discussion. Good discussion. Okay. Uh, in most cases, uh, I, as I had said earlier, a lot, a lot of uh, businesses, retailers, uh, use the perpetual system because of it automatically updates their records on hand. And so uh, I'm going to to run through a couple of examples of transactions that happen um, with that in that process. So let's say we we run a small convenience store, uh, Z Mart, and we purchased five hundred dollars worth of inventory from a vendor using cash. The vendor comes in, they say, "Hey, hey, uh, I got um, you know so many boxes of candies here." You know, like, because you know how it is when you go to the convenience store, like, there's a there's a box of each type of candy, yeah? And there's a whole bunch of bars in each box. So, th my vendor comes around, and he goes, hey, I got a, the, the candy that, um, you know, how much do you want to buy from me? So, I buy $500 from, from my vendor using cash. So, he comes to the counter, I verify the boxes. He tells, he tells me how he's going to sell me, so I give him the cash to purchase those boxes of candy that I'm going to sell in my convenience store. So I debit merchandise inventory, and I credit cash. And this is for the purchase of that inventory. I'm purchasing inventory, and I'm using cash. So remember, anytime I'm paying cash, I have to credit cash. Inventory is on asset it's an asset because remember it helps you to generate revenue so therefore it's an asset to the company it's a current asset inventory is a current asset because i'm going to i'm going to sell through that within the within a year right so i debit merchandise inventory which is an asset account and i credit cash to reduce my cash also an asset account I increased assets by 500. I decreased assets by 500. So this is the first transaction. Now let's say my vendor comes back in. Okay. This He comes in the next month. And he goes, hey, I'll sell you some candy. And I go, great. I'll, I'll buy the same stuff I bought last month. 500 bucks. And this time he goes, listen, we do, you and I, we have a relationship now. He goes, I trust you. Uh, I'm going to give you an offer. And the offer is, I'll let you pay me 30 days later. That's nice. Okay. He goes, not only if you pay, it, uh, will I allow you this credit to pay me on credit 30 days later, I'll give you a 2% discount on the amount if you pay me within the first 10 days. And I think to myself, well, that sounds like a solid deal to me. We call this terms, credit terms. Credit terms is the agreement. And the agreement is, I'll give you a discount if you pay me within a certain number of days. Otherwise, the whole thing is due within 30 days. This is very common practice because businesses need cash to operate, right? I and mean, when we start everything with cash, we use cash. And so if you offer a discount, it incentivizes the cash to be paid early. So here's how it works. My guy comes, my, my candy guy comes to me, he goes, hey, listen, you know, I'll, I'll buy the same thing, great, pay me within 30 days. But if you pay me in the first 10 days, I'll give you a 2% discount. So he hands me the invoice. The invoice says $500 candy, 
has his his information, my information, uh, and at the bottom it says terms two ten net thirty. It means two percent discount if paid within the first ten days. Otherwise, the net is due within 30 days. 210, net 30. 2% discount if paid within the first 10 days. Otherwise, the whole thing is due within 30 days. That's what terms 210, net 30 means. 2% discount if paid within the first 10 days. Otherwise, the whole thing's due within 30 days. 10, not 30. So, so if you're ever looking at an invoice in the near future and you see something like this, that's what that means. You get 2% discount if you pay it within the first 10 days. Otherwise, the whole thing's due within 30 days. It doesn't have to be 2%. It could be any percent, right? So it's totally up to the vendor. And so that incentivizes me to pay it within that first 10 days because I want that discount. I love discounts. Get that discount. So this is the invoice that my candy guy, uh, Tom, my candy guy, Tom, sent me. He goes, hey, uh, you know, this is uh, the types of candy. Uh, here's the quantities, right? And we see a couple things on, on this invoice, the seller information, invoice date, purchaser. The date it was ordered, the credit terms, which is probably the most important part on here, the freight, how it was shipped to me, uh, the the items that I purchased, total invoice amount, and the net amount. Now, uh, so the, uh, two, I guess three important items here. Number five, six, and nine. Number five is the terms, 210 net 30. 2% discount if I pay within the first 10 days. Otherwise, the whole thing is due in 30 days. This, the number six is freight, how it was shipped to me. The reason why that's important is because it represents who's, in, who's responsible for why while it's in transit. This is called free, th this freight says FOB destination. That means free on board destination. That means the, the shipper is responsible until it re reaches the destination. There's a reason why that's important. I'll we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then number nine is the net amount. So if I pay within that first 10 days, I'm only going to pay $490. Why is that? Because I got a 2% discount for paying in the first 10 days. That's why I'm going to pay in that first 10 days. So I paid them in the first 10 days. So I pay, so ten days later I paid them. So I debit my accounts payable to reduce my accounts payable, and I credit two items here. Cash for four hundred ninety. How four hundred ninety? Five hundred times ninety eight percent. Hundred minus two is ninety eight. Ninety eight percent of five hundred is four ninety. So four hundred ninety dollars, and I I uh, credit merchandise inventory. The difference ten dollars. That's the discount amount. The reason why I credit merchandise inventory by the discount amount is because I received a discount on my inventory. So that reduces the value of that inventory. Make sense? Good. Just a question. Yes, Why we please. put like, uh, we did 500, we didn't pay 500 because we paid in 10 days. That's right. We paid Should be just for Yeah. Yeah. So I can't pay, will they pay 490 and like is is it debit because debit it means plus right 
Uh, so not always. Debit doesn't always mean plus. Remember, uh, with asset accounts, we debit to increase the asset. So uh, with, with liabilities and equity accounts, when we debit, we're reducing those. So just be careful now, you know, with, with your debits and credits, because they, they mean different that. things, yeah? Mm -hmm. So in this transaction, I'm reducing my account payable, which is a liability, by debiting it. I'm so finally, the question here, so why we reducing 500, we're paying just 490? So, because I got the 2% discount. So, so remember, I, the, the earlier transaction is 210 net 30, 2% 2 discount if I pay within 10 days. Otherwise, I pay the whole 500 in 30 days. So I want to take advantage of that discount. So... I'm paying in that first 10 days. The whole bill was 500 bucks. So I debit accounts payable to reduce the, the whole bill amount, 500. I credit my cash 490. Because I'm only paying $490 in cash. I'm not giving them the whole 500. Because otherwise, there wouldn't be a discount, right? Because I got the 2% discount, so I only give the cash 490 to the to the vendor. That 2%, which is $10, I need to reduce the value of my inventory by the $10 because I got a discount on that inventory. Make sense? Yes. Yeah, good. Okay. All right. Uh, th this is just what the T accounts look like, the, the le general ledgers. This is, this is the effect on the general ledgers, right? We talked about general ledgers a couple chapters ago. Uh, maybe two, almost two weeks. Uh, so November 2nd, got the bill, 500 bucks. I increased my inventory, 500 bucks. 10 days later, I paid that bill. So I reduced the payable by 500. I reduced my cash by 490. And I reduced my in, uh, merchandise inventory by 10 to reflect the discount that I received. If I just paid the whole thing, let's say I didn't get the discount. 10, 10 days went by. And I forgot to pay the guy to get the discount. Ah, okay, so I'll pay the whole 500. That's a simple transaction. You just debit your accounts payable to reduce the payable by 500 and reduce your cash by crediting your cash by 500. Outside the discount period, you missed the discount. <laughs> oh, yeah. I hate missing discounts. I, I like saving money. Okay. I need to talk about this part. Purchase returns and allowances. Oh, man, I hate returns. I don't like returns because that means the inventory came back to me for some reason. Maybe it's broken. It's defective. The customer don't want it no more. There's a bunch of reasons for returns and allowances. A bunch of different reasons. 6.30, just checking. Okay, customers return stuff for whatever reason. It happens, okay? So we have returns and allowances for things like this. When a customer returns something to you, to your store, for whatever reason, it's just a return. The merchandise was returned by the purchaser to the supplier. Me, the person who sold it. It's a return. And returns, based on whatever the store's policy is, can be either store credit going back to the customer, uh, cash uh, return, cash going back to the customer, whatever, right? Whatever the store policy is for whatever it is that they're returning. 
That's returns. We also have purchase allowances. Sometimes a customer will buy something and it's defective. It's damaged, uh, defective, or otherwise unacceptable. So instead of the customer being like, ah, you know what, I'll just send it back, they'll take a price reduction. So it's kind of like, you know, let, let's let's say I go to Mike's uh, store later tonight and I grab some cans of dog food and smash them on the ground and then go to Mike and say, hey, these are, these are damaged. I, I want a discount. He'll give me what's called a purchase allowance. And what that is is it's a price reduction on the damaged cans of dog food. You know? So, yeah, uh, th- common, very common. I mean, not don't do that. I'm not saying to do that. That, but that's something that happens, yeah? So stuff gets damaged. Instead of us not just not selling it or whatever, we'll sell it at a discount to the, to the buyer. And that's called a purchase allowance, which is like a discount. Okay, so here's a purchase allowance example. Uh, I bought some stuff. From my supplier, it was damaged. Not all of it was damaged, but some of it was. So instead of me returning the whole order, I called my supplier up and they said, hey, just take a discount on your next order or take, take the discount off of what you owe us. So I decided to take it off what, they, what I already owe them. So I, I debit the accounts payable to reduce the accounts payable by the amount that was damaged. And I credit merchandise inventory to reduce the value of the damaged inventory. We call that an allowance. It's allowance for defective goods in this case. Sometimes you need to return stuff for whatever reason. To your, to your supplier. So let's walk through a couple of examples here. Three different transactions. Okay. So earlier, I had purchased uh, $250 of merchandise on June 1st. I had credit terms of, uh, what is this, 210 net 60. So I will get a 2% discount if I pay within the first 10 days Otherwise, the whole bill is due within 60 days. On June 3rd, so only two days later, I identified that I had some damaged inventory and when I received it. So I said, hey, you know what? I need to return some of this stuff to you. So on, uh, on the June 3rd, two days later, I returned uh, $50 worth of stuff to my supplier. So I took $50 off of the bill that they sent me and I sent them back the $50 worth of inventory. That happened on June 3rd. Then on June 11th, uh, I'm gonna going to take advantage of that 2% discount. Well, obviously I can't take a discount on something I returned, but I could take discount on the balance. Okay, so if the original purchase was for two fifty, I returned fifty dollars of it. So I'm going to take advantage of the two percent discount on the remaining two hundred. So the remaining accounts payable is two hundred bucks. I debit accounts payable two hundred to reduce the remaining bill. Uh, I'm going to credit my cash by 196 and credit merchandise inventory by $4. $4 is 2% of 200. So 196 I'm paying in cash to my vendor and I'm reducing my value of my inventory by $4 to represent that discount. So three different transactions stemming from the same purchase. Good so far?
Okay. I had said earlier uh, about the shipping terms. Shipping terms represents who's responsible for the shipping, okay, in terms of like insurance, the cost of shipping, et cetera. Someone has to pay shipping. Shipping ain't free, okay? You hear free shipping, it's free to you. <laughs> it still costs the seller. Free shipping isn't free. UPS and FedEx, they're not doing it for zero. <laughs> they're still going to get paid. Yeah, there's nothing free in life. I hope you understand that. The seller is paying the shipping cost when it's free to you. Yeah? You're the buyer. I'm the seller. I'll say, hey, if shipping's free. That means I'm paying for it. Someone's paying UPS. Someone's paying FedEx. Someone's paying the... the uh, postal service. It's still getting to you. Someone's paying for it. Wholesale rate, uh, sometimes. It depends on who it is. It depends on the, the, the deal that the seller made with those types of companies. Good question. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. Okay, so, uh, so I'm selling, okay? I'm the seller, you're the buyer. And you, when you buy, you have your own business, and you're going to then sell it to your customers, right? So I'm going to sell it to you. you UPS will deliver it to your store, and you'll sell it to your customers. So at, when it's in transit, someone's responsible for it. FOB shipping point and FOB destination. Here's how it works. FOB shipping point. The ownership transfers at the shipping point. The shipping point is when it leaves me, the seller. The second that I give that product, that inventory, to UPS, you're now responsible for it. Okay? You're responsible to the point where it left my door. You're responsible for it while it's in transit. That's FOB shipping point. So, yes, Professor. Yes, please. It, it, would there be insurance on the on the shipping of the merchandise? Uh, it depends. Uh, so sometimes it's optional. Sometimes it's required. It depends on the agreement between the buyer and seller. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good, great question. So, uh, so FLB shipping point is when the buyer is responsible for it while it's in transit. That also means that you're covering the cost. <laughs> so, so we debit merchandise inventory to increase uh, the inventory, and we credit cash because, you know, you're paying for it. So, so that's your transaction. FOB destination. FOB destination is when the seller, me, I'm responsible for it until it arrives to you, the buyer. That also means I'm uh, taking care of the shipping cost. So on my books, I debit delivery expense and I credit cash. Transportation costs some can, uh, to your point, include uh, think transportation costs includes things like the cost of shipping. It can also include things like insurance. It could include things like packing, packaging, you know, those types of things. A lot of times they lump it all together. But, yeah, sometimes there is like something like um, insurance. But they're all considered to be transportation costs. In this example, uh, my, uh, my awesome little convenience store, we purchased some merchandise. Uh, for, that's free on board shipping point. Uh, so the transportation charge is $75. Cost me an additional $75 to get it to my store. So I debit merchandise inventory, $75, credit cash, $75. The reason why I debit merchandise inventory and not like a uh, transportation expense is because 
the cost of the inventory to get it to you to then sell, that's all a part of cost of goods sold. So we need to make sure that anything related to the cost of you getting that inventory to sell to your customer, we make sure we include that in the cost of the inventory. Make sense? And make sure you include all of the related costs of that inventory. So that way, when you sell it to your customer, you're including that the, the total cost. It's it's the cost of the inventory when you purchased it, plus any type of transportation cost, plus any type of insurance. All of those things make up the total cost of the inventory. Here's an itemized list of inventory. Itemized cost, sorry. Uh, purchases. Minus any discounts. Uh, minus any returns. Plus cost of transportation equals the total cost of merchandise purchases. So purchases minus discount minus returns plus the cost of getting it to you. That's your total cost of purchases. Under the perpetual inventory system, that's the one that continuously updates. We compute gross profit by taking your sales, minus discounts, minus returns and allowances. Sales, minus cost of goods sold, equals gross profit. Sales, minus cost of goods sold, equals gross profit. The net sales, net sales means net of discounts, returns, and allowances. So after any discounts, returns, and allowances, that's your total sales. Minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit. Each transaction, when I sell merchandise, when I sell inventory, each transaction uh, involves two parts. Number one is, when do I recognize the revenue from my customer? course that's whenever the customer receives the merchandise the, the 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 goods right i recognize revenue when i deliver the goods to my customer when my customer receives the goods is when i recognize revenue that's the way the uh, revenue recognition principle works i recognize the second part of each of each sales transaction is i also recognize the cost of goods sold when I sell it to my customer. So for everything that I sell, right, I sold this bottle of water. I recognized the revenue from the sale of that bottle of water when you gave me the dollar and when I gave you the water. Okay? So I recognized the revenue, one dollar. I also recognized ten cents cost of goods sold when you receive your water and I receive that dollar. Remember, two part. Every time something is sold, it costs something to sell it. It costs me 10 cents to sell this bottle of water. Okay? So that's my cost of goods sold. And the revenue is $1 when I sold it to you for cash. Sometimes we sell things without cash discounts. Of course we do. <laughs> uh, I sold uh, our our uh, our uh, business sold a thousand dollars worth of merchandise on credit. So I sold my my customer a thousand dollars worth of stuff. They said I said, "Hey, pay me back in thirty days." So there's cost of goods sold associated with every sale, right? So I debit accounts receivable, because remember, I sold on credit. Customer's going to pay me 30 days later. And I credit sales, 
I still recognize sales because I sold my customer stuff. My customer received that stuff, but has not yet paid me. So debit accounts receivable, credit sales. Remember, sales is an equity account. Also on that same day for that same transaction, I need to recognize the cost of what I sold. Cost of goods sold. It cost me $300 to sell that inventory. So debit, cost of goods sold, $300. And credit, merchandise, inventory. Inventory, $300. Reducing my inventory because I sold it. Increasing my cost of goods sold because I sold it. <laughs> Make sense? Every single thing you sell, there are two entries. You recognize the revenue and the first entering and you recognize the cost of goods sold in the second entering there's two entries for everything that you sell sometimes when I sell something I might offer a discount and it works very similarly what it means is I'm going to get less in when I sell it on it at a discount in terms of cash, anyway. Okay, so my first entry, or first pair of entries, I sold $1,000 worth of stuff on credit. The terms were 210 net 45. I told my customer, I said, hey, listen, customer, if you pay me within the first 10 days, I'll give you 2% discount. Otherwise, the whole thing's due within 45 days. Customer says, great, sounds great. I'll definitely take advantage of that. So, if, of course, I recognize the sale. Debit accounts receivable, credit sales. And of course, I need to recognize what I sold. Debit cost of goods sold, credit inventory. Then my customer comes uh, and pays me within the 10 days. So 10 days later, I receive a check for $980. Great. So I debit cash, $980. The difference is 20 bucks. $20 is 2% of the 1000 bucks. So 20 bucks. I debit an account called sales discounts. I debit an account called sales discounts. This account, sales discounts, is uh, uh, it's a discount account. Right, it rep it represents the sales discounts that you that you issued. This account actually holds a um, it holds a credit balance normally, and it shows up as an asset. It's a it's a it's a very rare account, and when you see it, it shows up as an asset with a credit balance. Yeah. Uh, and then accounts receivable. Credit account receivable to reduce the thousand bucks. Now, what if they, my customer, pays me after the discount period? Well, it's simple. They're going to pay me a thousand dollars in cash and credit their account by a thousand dollars. Sometimes we lose sales. Customer not happy. Customer not happy. Uh, so they return it. Sometimes I give them uh, an allowance. Say, hey, you know what? I'll give you a discount uh, next time you come back, or I'll give you a discount on um, the merchandise you bought from me to help to save the sale from the customer. Otherwise, just give them a full refund, but they'll probably never come back. <laughs> yeah. some, that's, some, that's life, yeah. Uh, okay, so a customer comes in. They return some merchandise that I sold them. They return all of it. They return some of it. So I debit uh, an account called sales returns and allowances. And I credit cash to give them some cash back. Uh, they gave me the inventory back and it was not defective. Good news. I can put it right back in inventory and then sell it again. So debit, merchandise inventory, credit cost of goods sold. I'm putting the inventory back where it was to have it resold again. 
let's say the customer returns the inventory and it's damaged. I can't, I can't sell damaged stuff. Debit merchandise inventory for what I can sell. Credit loss of uh, damaged merchandise, credit cost of goods sold to reduce cost of goods sold. It happens. It's rare, but it happens. Let's assume uh, $40 worth of uh, merchandise I sold on November 12th is defective, but the buyer decides to keep it. So I'll be nice and give my customer a, a disc, uh, um, you know, a discount on their purchase. So debit, sales, returns, and allowances, credit cash. Sometimes I'm nice like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, as you know, with the accounting cycle, at the end of the accounting period, we make adjusting entries. And some of these are adjusting entries that we would have made. An example of an adjusting entry that we would make at the end of the accounting period is for this thing called shrinkage. It means we lost some merchandise for whatever reason. It could have been stolen. It could have been misplaced. It could have been never showed up, but we still paid for it for whatever reason. We call that shrinkage. It's when, it's when we, the business, lose our, in, our inventory for whatever reason. Or, or maybe I, I, I used it as a demonstration, so I expense it out. So what we do is we debit costs that get sold, and we credit merchandise inventory to adjust for the loss of that, of that um, inventory. Uh, and then, of course, at the end of the accounting cycle, we close out our temporary accounts. So we uh, first thing we do is we debit sales, credit and income summary. Then we close out our temporary accounts, debit, income summary, credit all of our temporary accounts. Close those out to income summary minus any withdrawals. And that becomes our um, net income on the balance sheet. There are two different formats the income statement comes in, and a lot of time it depends on what type of business we're talking about. With a merchandise business, the multi-step income statement format shows us the gross profit, income from operations, net income. Sales minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit minus your expenses equals that income. That's a multi-step format. It shows us all the levels of detail on the income statement. We call that a multi-step, just more than one step. A single-step income statement uh, is kind of like the collapsed version. It doesn't show us gross profit. It shows us revenue minus expenses equals net income. And a part of expenses is cost goods sold. That's on the single step income statement. The vast majority of retailers use the multi-step income statement because they want to see gross profit. Revenue minus cost goods sold equals gross profit minus expenses equals net income. That's the multi-step income statement. The single step income statement is revenue minus expenses equals net income. And cost of goods sold is classified as an expense on the single step. But you'll notice that they both, either version that you use, multi step or single step, the net income is always going to be the same. Again, it's just a, a matter of preference of how it's formatted. But the vast majority of retailers use multi step income statements. Make life more detailed, easier to manage off of. On the balance sheet, on the balance sheet, we have merchandise inventory, also known as inventory. As a, and that's a current asset because we sell through our inventory within one year. As you know from our earlier discussions, the balance sheet is organized in terms of liquidity. 
The word liquidity means how quickly I can convert something into cash. We had this conversation last week. So our balance sheet uh, starts with current assets. In current assets, we have cash, accounts receivable, inventory, office supplies, store supplies, prepaid insurance, any other types of assets. These are current assets, yeah? It's organized by liquidity. Merch, we see that inventory is the third most liquid because I can liquidate my inventory and turn it into cash. Pretty easily, in fact. As a manager, or as a business owner, or someone who's interested in understanding the financial health of a company, we, of course, use ratios. And one of those ratios is called the acid test ratio. The acid test ratio shows us how quickly we're selling through our inventory. And we find this by taking our quick assets divided by our, quick, our, our current liabilities. Quick assets are assets that can be very quickly converted into cash. This would include things like cash, short-term investments, and accounts receivable. Cash plus short-term investments plus accounts receivable divided by current liabilities gives us the asset test ratio. Anything greater than one is good. Anything less than one, we're in trouble. And the other thing any business owner wants to know is profitability. What is the profit margin on the things that I'm selling? We can calculate the gross margin ratio. Profit margin, gross margin ratio. We take sales Minus cost of goods sold divided by sales. That gives us our gross margin ratio. It's profit margin ratio. Very useful information. Okay, any questions, comments, concerns on uh, uh, our merchandising business? You all good so far? So far, yes. I just need to figure out how I'm going to use it at work now with this new information. <laughs> yeah, great question, Mike. It, you know, there's there's a lot of different ways I'm sure you'll be able to to put it to good use. Yeah, I mean, pretty much. You know, I I normally work on the trucks. There's certain times where, like, um, which process? I got the uh, PowerPoint right here. The uh, perpetual system. Sometimes with I'm sorry for if I'm rambling, but sometimes at at work our perpetual system kind of mess things up. Sometimes it gives us overstock of an item and we're like oh dear god we don't need like five ten of these we don't and other times it's like well we only have two yet we just sold like seven of those so it's like Eesh. and more so and now it's more affected too with COVID. exactly exactly right yeah and, uh that that perpetual system it's so important to you know do everything you can to make sure that it's correct too so that's why we go through something like an audit process so we do like a physical count of what we have on the store shelf uh, before we add, an, add in the inventory that just came off the truck because we need to make sure that we're keeping accurate track of what we have available uh, for sale. Yeah, it's a whole process. I, I totally hear you. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Okay, uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop this part of the recording and then uh, let's take a five-minute break and then we'll jump into uh, Chapter 6.